Welcome back to the Dirt Show. What on earth is going on in the House of Representatives? Why can't the Republicans get their house in order? They won the election. There are more Republicans than Democrats in the House. They have the majority. Committee chairmen uh, are waiting to take over and do to the Democrats what the Democrats did to them. That's certainly what Jim Jordan would like to do when he becomes chairman of the Judiciary Committee and and perhaps uh, other chairmen as well plan to do that. But they can't even swear in members of Congress. It, it's ironic. The people who are now voting for who will be Speaker of the House are not members of Congress. They were elected. They're members elect. Um, it's the day they're supposed to be sworn in. All of their parents and grandparents and children and uncles and aunts and college roommates are there to watch the swearing in, but no, 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 it's not going to happen. And um, the House of Representatives just adjourned for the night. And so we've had these votes. Uh, they, in 1920, people voting against uh, Kevin McCarthy for uh, Speaker uh, of the House. Uh, um, I want to make two analogies before we get into too much detail. Number one, same thing could easily have happened when the Democrats uh, narrowly controlled the House of uh, Representatives. It wasn't as narrow as this. But remember, there are as many Democrats, 20 or so, uh, who are fringe extremists on the hard left who didn't like Nancy Pelosi being Speaker of the House. You can be sure that there are plenty of members of the squad and their, and their associates who um, would have preferred one of their own candidates, in fact, maybe Jeffries, um, who's now taken over as minority leader of, of Democrats of the House. Um, but Pelosi, to her credit, managed to herd the cats and keep them together. Um, and, and with a lot of reluctance, I think, um, she was uh, elected. Um, it, it could easily have happened. The other way, it could easily have happened that uh, what we're seeing with the Republicans could have happened with the Democrats, if not for different personalities. I think that Nancy Pelosi is a more effective leader and um, more likable to her constituents. Apparently, I don't know Kevin McCarthy. I've met um, um, uh, Nancy Pelosi. I don't know her, um, but um uh, she seems more amiable than than McCarthy. Uh, and look, it, as with so many things in contemporary America, this all goes back to Donald Trump, of course. I mean, the reason for this is that the Freedom Caucus and the MAGA extremists, you know, who still think that um, um, that Donald Trump is the president of the United States and that uh, Joe Biden is a pretender who actually lost the election. Uh, that's the reason uh, for this, ultimately. Uh, uh, that's the reason the Republicans didn't do that well in the midterm elections, because uh, almost everybody who supported that fiction of um, Biden having lost the election lost their elections. And many of the people who Trump supported lost their elections, not all, but enough so that what was supposed to be a red wave, a romp, turned into a very, very close election. So that's one comparison between what's going on with the Republicans today and what would go on with the Democrats at some future time or could easily have gone on with the Democrats had they not have had as effective a leader as Nancy Pelosi. The other comparison I want to make is, as you know, I just came back from Israel. It's the same thing there. It's the same thing there. Netanyahu is Kevin McCarthy. That is he is the kind of center right guy who uh, was elected uh, as the head of the Likud, and the Likud got the most votes, and he was asked to put his government together, but he couldn't do it. Couldn't do it for a few weeks because you got the people on the extreme right, the people like the people who voted against McCarthy um, uh, today, um, uh, people who wouldn't join his government, wouldn't allow him a majority unless he was willing to make a lot of compromises, some of them much, much too far to the right. Um, for example, we saw Ben Gavir, one of the people who was brought in to the government, uh, along with uh, Smutridge. Um, ben Gavir goes to the Temple Mount, which 
there's a deal. You know, you're not supposed to upset the status quo. Um, I don't like the deal. I think Jews should be allowed to pray on the Temple Mount. It's where the uh, Bet Migdash, the Holy Temple, was for for many years, and it's where you know a mosque is um, the fifth or sixth or seventh or twelfth most holy mosque. Uh, it varies uh, when the um, Jews control it. It's the second or third most important uh, mosque when the Jews don't control it. It's the twelfth or thirteenth most important mosque. So it, it's very very political, obviously. Uh, Jerusalem isn't even mentioned in the Quran except um, um, by a different name and uh, as as perhaps the place where Muhammad w- went up to heaven. But uh, it, it, Jerusalem was never so holy a city uh, in, in Islam until, until the conflict with uh, Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people arose and then it became a flashpoint. But in any event, uh, these extreme right wingers are creating problems. Bibi Netanyahu had to cancel a trip now to the Gulf um, because of tensions that arose as the result of um, right-wingers going to the Temple Mountain and trying to change the status quo. So um, uh, Bibi Netanyahu managed to do what um, McCarthy has thus far not been able to do, and that is extend enough of an olive branch and uh, offer enough compromises to um, get a majority and put together his uh, government, uh, which he's managed to do. McCarthy hasn't uh, done that yet. I don't think he will do it. It's conceivable that he might, um, but there'd have to be a lot of horse trading and a lot of concessions. And um, one of the concessions would weaken the Speaker of the House considerably. The extremists want to have any one member of Congress call for a vote to oust the Speaker of the House. Um, McCarthy has given in to that for the most part, but he said, I want five. You need five. They get five easily. So I don't think it's a big difference between one and five. It just means that virtually a tiny number of people could put the um, Speaker of the House uh, out of office. It would turn the House of Representatives essentially into a parliamentary system where by a simple vote uh, of parliament, whether it be the British parliament or the Italian parliament or the French parliament or the Israeli parliament, um, usually all you need is a majority vote and you get rid of the prime minister. That's why there are no impeachments in, of, of prime ministers in most other parts of the world. Um, that's why it's such an important provision in the American Constitution, because there's no way of ending an American presidency other than by unelecting him after four years or by impeaching him or her. Uh, for um, treason, bribery, other high crimes and misdemeanors. You know my views on that. Um, In any event, um, so far, compromises have not been uh, accepted by the hardliners. We thought the hardliners may have been five or six or seven. Uh, It turns out they're now 20. Now, you know, it may be that there are 20 because there are 20 people there who would like to get compromises in their favor uh, good committee chairmanships um, or other things that that favor uh, them. Um, uh, and one way of getting those favors uh, is to hold out and 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 make a quid pro quo. Essentially, I'll, I'll vote for you on the fourth ballot, the fifth ballot, the sixth ballot. But you have to promise me the chairmanship of this, of this committee or subcommittee that may be going on. And that may be the reason why there was um, an adjournment so that that kind of horse trading, which is best done out of public view, um, can be uh, accomplished. Uh, We don't know. I have to tell you, the framers of the American Constitution did not create a system designed for efficiency. If you want to have an efficient system, you have a parliamentary system. It's one body. It rules. The parliament then decides who the prime minister is going to be. And in some parliamentary systems, they decide who the judges are are going to be. It's very efficient. And if um, there's a a vote of no confidence, uh, you get a new prime minister. The American system couldn't be more cumbersome. There are basically four branches of of government. You learn in civics that there are only three, but there are four. You know, there's the executive, the president, really five, when you think about it. There's the president. He's the executive. There's the administrative agencies, which are under technically the president, but they're independent now. Many of them, um, they make as much law as Congress does. So you have the presidency, 
you have the administrative agencies, the alphabet agencies, the New Deal agencies, uh, which are now coming under some Supreme Court um, uh, control. So that's two. Then you have the judiciary is, is, is three, although you have the Supreme Court and then you have lower courts as well. And then you have a bicameral legislature, which really means two separate legislatures. You can't get anything done unless both houses agree. So in order to really get anything done, essentially, you need five branches uh, agreeing. And, and at a time of such enormous division in our country, ideologically, politically, uh, religiously, racially, ethnically, um, you name it, um, um, gender, um, it's very difficult to get anything done. As I've said before, I think I said it yesterday on the show, if the United States didn't have a constitution and there was a constitutional convention, <laughs> it would never end. Um, it would make the House of Representatives vote seem like it's uh, a simple vote. We'd never agree on a constitution today. We're much too divided a country and uh, we're much too divided a people and, and, and too divided a media. By the way, our system of checks and balances, although it officially contains only the five branches of government, also includes uh, essentially um, non-governmental um, institutions like the media. They have an enormous impact on uh, American governance. The academy, which unfortunately today has had something of a negative influence on um, um, uh, governance, but it's there. Uh, religion, uh, we have separation of church and state, which was essentially another, when you think about it, another form of check and balance. In most countries in the world, um, in the end of the 18th century, uh, the church was controlled by the state or the state was controlled by the church. The Anglican church in England still is the official church um, in many European countries as well. There's still an official established church. And by brilliantly separating church from state in the <clears throat> First Amendment of the Constitution, we created another check. That is, religion now is an independent check on governance. Um, it's not controlled by the government. The First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of the press, is also another check and balance. Um, in communist countries, obviously, there's no free press. The government controls the press. <coughs> Sorry, I'm still suffering a little from COVID. The, um, in China, nothing gets put in the press unless the Communist Party wants it there. Um, in Russia, nothing gets put in the press unless Putin wants it there. In America, everything gets put in the press that the president doesn't want or that Congress doesn't want. So we have these informal mechanisms of checks and balances that are part of our constitutional scheme. After all, they are in the First Amendment to the Constitution, uh, the media, church and state, um, uh, academia, because there's also the First Amendment protects academic freedom. Um, and so the system of checks and balances is not designed to get things done efficiently, but it's also not necessarily designed to have gridlock over everything. And so today the balance has shifted too far away from appropriate checks and balances and too much toward uh, partisan gridlock. And I suspect that what's going on in the House today, the inability to vote for and have a majority vote for a particular Speaker of the House of Representatives is going to be fairly uh, typical of what's going to happen once the Speaker is selected. Let's assume the Speaker is selected still has to pass legislation. And if you get a Republican Party that is dominated by the Freedom Caucus, and it's a small majority, and if they can't work with the Democrats, and that 20-person minority says, no, we're not going to allow legislation to pass unless you give us A, B, C, D, um, right-wing extremist views on everything, we're, we're not going to pass legislation. We may see this gridlock extend well beyond the days or weeks even that might be required for selecting a speaker. Look, we could come out of tonight's um, uh, delays and, uh, and, and find out tomorrow morning there's a speaker. I don't think so. I doubt it. I think this is going to go on and on in the end. 
nobody knows whether it'll be Kevin McCarthy or whether it'll be somebody else. Who that person would be, we don't know. You know, there's a strange rule in 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 the House. Um, the Speaker of the House, who is second in line to be President of the United States, does not have to be a member of the House of Representatives. Think about that. Think about a President of the United States becoming president upon, tragically, the death of the president and vice president, being somebody who is not elected to anything, who was never elected a private citizen. You, me, we could be Speaker of the House, um, and we could be president without being elected. That seems to be a pretty deep flaw in the Constitution, but it's there. And so, you know, technically, the Republicans could nominate Donald Trump to be Speaker of the House. Or on the other side, they could, you know, nominate um, somebody. They could actually nominate a senator um, to be Speaker of the House. One of the people that was in the list on the list was Ron Paul, who's very acceptable to hard right libertarians um, and, and probably moderately acceptable to, to the middle. It's not something I would support or vote for, but um, it could be a senator. It could be somebody from the executive branch of the government. It could be somebody from academia. It could be anybody. And then they're second in line for the presidency. The person who's third in line of the presidency was just picked today, a uh, uh, senator from, from Vermont. And uh, she's the first woman to be president pro temp of the Senate. And she's next in line. Um, and then it's the Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, and go down the cabinet in order of its creation. Fortunately, we've never had that situation, but, you know, with always the potential for, for example, 9-11 could have if the plane were directed in a different way and had been a different trajectory, could easily have killed the president and the vice president, although in that case, the president was off reading to children somewhere in a different part of the country. But one can easily imagine a situation where a president and a vice president were together and were, were killed at the same time. And uh, you would go down the list of people who would then be um, um, president of the United States. And the idea that a speaker of the House, number number three, number two, I mean, the president's the president, then number one is the vice president, number two is the speaker. The speaker could be somebody who was never elected to any official a governmental position would, I think, shock uh, a lot of people. So welcome to Washington gridlock. Um, Yogi Berra said prediction is difficult, especially about the future. So I'm not going to make any predictions about who the next Speaker of the House will be. I think it's today seeming less and less likely that it's going to be Kevin McCarthy. But the 20 on the extreme right are not going to be able to come up with a candidate that is satisfactory to um, the middle. Uh, there will always be five or six or seven people from either side, left or right, center, that will have enough votes to prevent somebody from becoming uh, the speaker unless there's a, a widespread consensus. Consensus. There are a couple of names, obviously, um, that have been put forward that could conceivably be consensus candidates. Um, number two and three people in the House of Representative leadership of the Republican Party could. Now, th there are those who speculate, what about Jeffries? Um, he's gotten more votes than McCarthy. Why isn't he Speaker of the House? No, it's not the way it works. You need to get a majority of all the members of the House who are there and, and, and voting. Um, and so um, there are not enough Democrats to create a majority for a Speaker of the House. I mean, if a number of Republicans decided to vote for the Democratic candidate, then Jeffries could be the Speaker. That's not going to happen. And, um, um, you know, it, the other conceivable possibility, if the votes go on and on and on and people get sick and people get tired and people have other commitments, you may get a vote suddenly where a lot of people are missing. And then if all the Democrats are there, there could be a majority of those voting for the speaker to be a Democrat. Again, I don't think that's going to happen, but it's it's conceivable. So we live in interesting times as the Chinese curse goes, and uh, we live in divisive times. And again, um, 
Donald Trump probably bears responsibility. Some of you may think that's positive. Some of you may think it's negative. But I don't think anybody could dispute that the election of Donald Trump and then his failure to win re-election and his claim that he won the election um, have contributed mightily to the division in this country. Maybe they just revealed divisions that pre-existed, but certainly they were major contributing factors to what we see in the House of Representatives uh, today. So let's see what happens tomorrow. Maybe by tomorrow we'll have a speaker. Don't know. So let's get to some letters. This is a good one. I would think the average life expectancy. Remember, I talked about why judges were appointed for life because life expectancy was much lower than it is today. Got a couple of letters purporting to correct me. I'll read one of them. It's typical. Um, I would think the average life expectancy being lower in that era would have more to do with children dying young rather than adults dropping dead in their early 50s. There's a lot of truth to that, but it's a combination of the two. So I went back and, of course, did my research and did some um, investigation. In the year 1900, if a person reached 15, um, he uh, was likely, according to uh, the charts that life insurance companies use, he was likely to live to 61 so if you reached 15 in 1900, if you were born in 1900 in 1915, you were likely to live till 1961. On the other hand, if you were born in 2020 and reached 15, you were likely to live to age 77. That's a 16 year difference. That's pretty considerable. And when you go back earlier to the 19th century, the um, uh, numbers are even a more dramatic. So yes, of course, a lot of life expectancy was a function of infant mortality, but uh, they counted life expectancy in two different ways, from birth to death, or from maturity, 15 years old, uh, to death. But by, by, by either standard, the um, change has been quite dramatic, much more dramatic if you count infant mortality uh, than if you just count um, uh, adults who are, who are dying. So um, good correction, but uh, the truth is somewhere in between. Oh, here's one that just says, Jim Jordan wants the chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee. Of course he does. He He's looking to get even. He's looking to set up a committee like the January uh, 6th committee. Maybe it'll be the Hunter Biden committee, but yeah, he'll play the same game, raise the same constitutional challenges, that the uh, Democrats did when they were in control of the Judiciary Committee. Okay, this is interesting. Recently visited the Harvard Coop. Obviously, I was at Harvard for over 50 years and um, probably sold, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of books um, at the Harvard Coop. Maybe that's more, but a lot, a lot of books. I've had, after all, a number. I've had a number one bestseller on the New York Times and seven other bestsellers. So I recently went to the Harvard Coop. Uh, we asked two employees where to find Alan Dershowitz's books. One employee said he is persona non grata around here after 50 years because I defended President Trump on persona non grata in a store, the Harvard Coop, that's supposed to cater to everybody. Um, I just said I was a supporter of free speech, and she apologized for a possibly offensive comment. Anyway, the Coop had three of your books. Uh, well, two copies of one volume for a total inventory of four books. So obviously the coop is doing to my books what the Chilmark Library uh, did to my books as well. Um, um, bookstores today have enormous amount of control over what people read. And the Harvard Coop apparently doesn't like my views uh, on the Constitution. And so they're not selling my books. Um, uh, you know, even they're 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 they're. Uh, biting their nose to spite their face because obviously they make money off books and my books were frequently a bestseller, certainly at the Coop. They used to feature them in the window all the time. And I would have uh, book events at the Coop where I would read from my books. But if you defend President Trump uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, your persona non grata. Okay. Ideally, the Supreme Court would be apolitical, but because it's not, I'd like to see it structured 
so that there's a balance of political ideology with four liberals and four conservatives with the chief justice alternating between liberal and conservative every four years. Well, that's not the way I want to see it. I, I don't want to see any liberals or conservatives. I want to see nine justices uh, who are great, great jurists uh, who understand the rule of law. And uh, I couldn't care less whether they were uh, liberal or conservative or libertarian or whatever. Um, what I want to see is uh, justices who obey the Constitution and uh, who um, understand the rule of law. And I, over time, over history, there have been liberals, there have been conservatives. You know, Justice Harlan, when he got put on the Supreme Court, stopped voting, um, which was his right to do, um, to vote as a justice. But he said he didn't want anything to influence his judicial decisions over the days where that were that were the case no longer okay here's you always have to have one little nasty one every 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 day to their credit indeed the supreme court of the united states had the wisdom to dismiss the appeal of pedophile murderer leo frank remember leo frank he was the innocent person uh who was jewish uh in atlanta georgia who was framed for the murder of um, a young Southern woman, it was proved conclusively uh, that he was not there and that um, he was not guilty. And uh, ultimately the governor commuted his sentence to life imprisonment. And then he was taken out and lynched by a gang of people, including ministers and sheriffs and, and uh, doctors and prominent people in Marietta, uh, Georgia. Uh, and then this letter continues. Even so, justice was upheld by the brave men of Georgia, brave men of Georgia, who went and captured uh, and blindfolded uh, a poor guy, uh, tied him up uh, and hung him from a tree. The brave men of Georgia who carried out the sentence themselves. Is this an instance of past as prologue? Funny, your pal Greenblatt, I don't know who that is, but it's a Jewish name, took some liberties with the facts of the case while aggressively race baiting once a liar, always a liar, kind of like you, Alan, a lying pedo, or pedo, I don't even know how you pronounce it, but th that's, that's my hate letter for the day. Get, get them every day. Sometimes they're a little bit more intelligent. This one was pretty stupid and ahistorical. Um, okay. Interesting. It's the institution that's important. I was talking about the Supreme Court as an institution. Uh, not the drift of its decisions. So simple, the distinction. You didn't change, you don't change an institution unless it's broken. It's like Congress or the presidency. You may not like the laws or executive orders. That doesn't mean you tear down and remake it. There is the difference of the election of two branches, but an independent court is necessary. There's enough democratic influence on the court by president nomination and then the Senate confirms. I agree with that. I think the Supreme Court of the United States has a lot of democratic input by the method of selection and confirmation, but it ought to be uh, an elite institution that applies the Constitution fairly without partisan favor. I normally agree with you over 90% of the time, despite our different political points of view. However, I find fault in your analysis of the Israeli Supreme Court. The primary problem is that the court has become so left-oriented that it has created a situation where conservatives tend not to even enter the legal profession there. Uh, it's just not true. Um, the legal profession is essentially conservative, um, centrist, conservative. Um, most uh, of the um, um, members of the Knesset uh, from Likud, or many of them are lawyers. Um, many of the current uh, people in the right-wing government are lawyers. So there are lots and lots of conservative lawyers uh, in Israel. Um, and so uh, I think the Supreme Court of Israel is a very good institution. It, it It's not that it leans left, it's that it leans toward human rights, it, that it leans toward basic civil liberties and basic equality. You may think of those as left. I think of those as part of the essential rule of law. And I hope that the Supreme Court of Israel, as well as the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, continues to incline itself toward liberty and toward freedom and, and, and away from uh, 
um, denying people uh, basic rights and basic uh, liberty. Okay, there's another letter about life expectancy, but I've already read that. Uh, Professor, I recognize you are a patriot in the most positive sense of the word for the Democratic Party. I'm not a patriot for the Democratic Party. I easily could vote um, for a Republican Party if it the right circumstances. But if you are certain that after winning the White House and control over both houses of Congress in the 2024 election, the Democrats were going to abolish the filibuster, pack the Supreme Court, and pass laws giving their party unassailable advantages in future elections, would you then consider voting for Republicans? Of course I would. It depends on who the Republican was, um, but I could easily uh, vote for Mitt Romney. In fact, I regret not having voted for Mitt Romney um, when he ran against um, Barack Obama. I think it was a, a mistake on my part. If I had that vote to take back, I would take it back and vote for, for Mitt Romney. Um, I also uh, can imagine myself voting for either of the Bushes, um, depending on who they ran against again. Um, but um, I could vote for a Republican, and I certainly would never vote for a party that uh, wanted to uh, pack the Supreme Court and pass laws giving uh, partisan advantage to one party rather than the other. Okay, uh, so this show endorses COVID and vaccines. How do you endorse COVID? I guess I endorse COVID by getting it. Uh, you can hear it in my voice. I'm still I'm in my second on my like 15th day of COVID, I'm getting a little better, but I still have it. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, to be clear of it, but COVID exists. Um, it's not a myth. And um, thank God for vaccines. I had uh, four of them, um, four boosters plus the original vaccine. And I'm confident that it made my COVID uh, less serious. Uh, I'm also in favor of complete openness and debate about these issues. I'm not in favor of censoring debate. I debated Robert Kennedy. Uh, he and I disagree about vaccines. And YouTube took down his part of the debate and wanted to keep up my part of the debate. And I said, no way. It was a debate. So both parts have to stay. And so we moved the debate over to Rumble, where it got over a million views. So yeah, I endorse, I don't know what it means to endorse COVID. COVID is real. And the vaccines really do help. See you tomorrow.